Hi everyone, this is part 3 of our robotic design series. In the previous video we created a robot arm that prioritized form over function, where we put the call factor above everything else and relied on implied functionality to make it seem somewhat believable. In this video we're going to do the opposite by creating a robot arm that puts function above form, meaning that the result will have much less of the call factor, but its functionality will be clear to demonstrate. This means that afterwards we will be able to pose and animate it with ease. Let's start off by taking a look at some example references. These three are what we would generally consider as small desktop sized robot arms, where all of the wiring is self-contained, except for any electrical power inputs that will likely be on the back of the base. On the right here we have a KUKA Titan, which is one of the largest industrial robotic arms available and can carry up to 1.3 thousand kilograms. I've had a go at operating these two in real life. There are some interesting structural differences between smaller and larger robots. You can generally notice that some elements of functionality have to be mounted externally for one reason or another. We are going to be building a smaller one, mostly taking inspiration from the one on the left where the body is very symmetrical. As well as this we will give it a gripper that is also mostly self-contained as opposed to the gripper from the previous video which is a bit all over the place. Over here we have the end result. One of the most significant priorities about this design compared to the previous is that we want to make sure that our pivots for the objects are in the correct place. As well as this, I'll also be making detail objects children of larger structural pieces. For example, the screws on the sides will become children of the structural elements they are connected to. On top of this, each subsequent axis will become a child of the previous, meaning that as we rotate one part of the arm, everything else will follow suit. So let's jump into it. Like most 3D creations, we start off with a fundamental primitive, in this case a cylinder, because we can stretch it out to create the major structural pieces of the arm. One note about stretching out cylinders this way is that you need to be aware of the middle two vertices, and make sure that the amount I drag all other vertices next to the middle is the same on each side, so it's proportional, and then using the loop tools add-on I select the two faces at the top and bottom respectively, and use the flatten operation found through the W menu, loop tools and then flatten, although the position of this operation may be different depending on your Blender version. I'm also using hard ops to give the structural pieces nice curved beveled edges because these are simple shapes that are placed directly next to each other. Without the beveled edges, the point of separation between the objects may be difficult to distinguish. The curvature also just looks much nicer. Duplicating pieces that I've already made is something I do fairly often because there's no point recreating something from the ground up if it's much faster to achieve the same result by duplicating another piece and making some minor changes. I'll be making continual changes to the sizing of the different structural pieces, especially in terms of length. Generally speaking, the further you get away from the base, the thinner the structural pieces should become, because you'd want your center of gravity to be as low to the ground as possible, so the arm doesn't fall over or tear itself apart when moving. I'm trying to keep the same general shape as the inspiration, even though there's any number of ways to build this kind of robot. At every point of this though, I know exactly where I want my pivot points to be for each of the structural pieces, although I'll leave it until the modeling is further down the line before I set them up. Now I'm creating the base for the robot to sit on. There should be a fair amount of weight in this to keep the arm stable when moving. This is also where the onboard circuitry and largest motor would be for rotating the whole robot on the vertical axis. Now I've got the major basic structure done, I'm going to add some finer details such as extrusion and beveling on the plating, as well as screws. 
I want to make sure that the details I place would have some discernible reason for being there, such as the result of a production method, which is why I'm taking most of these details from the reference imagery. The valleys I create in the center of the structural pieces I've put there to represent two halves of a symmetrical form being produced individually and then being connected together afterwards. I want to add a pack on the back of the base for power input and two-way data transfers. This is the de facto place to put ports on most desktop size robot arms, so that's where I'm going to be putting it. So this is where I'm starting to put the object origins in the correct place for pivoting. Since this robot arm has mostly been built on the grid, one trick I like to use is to create basic objects and use them as reference points in 3D space. I can place it exactly where I want the pivot point to be on the grid, then move the 3D cursor to it, and then select the structural element again and move the object origin of that structural element to the 3D cursor using the infamous shift Control alt c hotkey present in 2.79. This is also where I'll start making the structural pieces parents of the detail pieces. Occasionally, I'll wobble the axes around to see what details I've forgotten to add to the hierarchy. Another thing to remember is to apply mirror modifiers when doing this, so the object will behave appropriately and as one whole. We can see that the pivoting works fine, which means the arm should be good to pose and animate from this point onwards if we wanted to. I took the gripper from the non-realistic model just to see what it would look like attached to this new one, but I knew that it wouldn't be suitable for this particular situation, so I would end up changing it later on. It will act as a placeholder until I make the new gripper based off of our current references. I add some wires for the ports on the back of the base, just to demonstrate the feeds. Later on I will give these coloured materials just to make it more interesting. Now we begin making the new gripper that will be more appropriate to this self-contained design. It will be smaller in range, but it will get the job done. I build it in a way that the gripper pads are on an extended slider so that they can be moved further apart without it looking weird.
Now I'm just giving some material variation to parts of the object to make it more interesting to look at rendered. The wires will be our little splash of colour to stop it from being completely monochrome. Following this, I want to add some more structural details that would make sense, extra screws or bolts, some structural valleys from manufacture, and indents in the base where the motor is mounted underneath. In the end, this is what we've ended up with. It's simpler and cleaner than the first arm because we've prioritized function over form this time. If we compare the two, we can see this quite clearly. But of course, I've kind of been pushing this point to its boundary and trying to demonstrate it. The major caveat here is that there are obviously ways to synergize a complex artistic style with functionality, and many people do this very well. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in the next video. We're going to discuss good design practices for making things that are both cool and functional. So if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and ring that bell. And I'll see you in part four.